But Micah had watched the northern kingdom because of their idolatry, because of their harlotry of leaving the Lord. They had gone into this place of judgment. And now in the southern kingdom, he was beginning to see the same thing. As a result, Judah had dissolved. They had terrible leadership. And it's always sad when you see that happen. We're seeing that happen in our culture today. You know what? I remember when I was a kid, if something outrageous happened or somebody tried to bring some silly lawsuit or somebody tried to get some law passed that just seemed ridiculous, you'd be like, oh, well, good luck. You, you, you'd be able to laugh about it because you go, well, you know what, good sense and the common morality is going to rise up and just not let those things happen. And even if the law does get passed by some fluke, the people are going to just make it so it's, it's of no effect whatsoever. No one's going to go for that. But now you see things happening that you just never believed would. There, there are evil things and, and encroachments that, that you don't see any, any consensus to rise up and say this is wrong. And it's heartbreaking. And you, you see injustice beginning to prevail. And Michael was watching this happen to his, his blessed, beloved Judah. And he knew judgment was coming and there was no remedy and there was nothing to lean on. There was no hope that this could turn around. That's when Micah describes it in the first part of chapter 7. He describes how he feels. He says, how miserable I am. I feel like the fruit picker after the harvest who can't, can find nothing to eat. Not a cluster of grapes or a single early fig can be found to satisfy my hunger. The godly people have all disappeared. No one's honest. There isn't one left on the earth. They're all murderers, setting traps even for their own brothers. Both their hands are equally skilled at doing evil. Officials and judgments alike that ban bribes. The people with indulgence get what they want, and together they scheme to twist justice. It's always terrible when we see that begin to happen. Where there's loss, and there's no shred of hope on the horizon. There's nothing that we can lean our hope on. We, we won't have any leaders to lean on. There's no money to lean on. Either there's a, a lack of money, or the money that you have couldn't possibly buy your way out of these problems. There, there may be not that kinds of problems. There's no camaraderie to lean on. The people that, that you would think that would understand with you, they they, they don't. You feel completely alone and cut off from, from any, any fellowship or being understood. And there's no future plan that you have or some scheme that, hey, this will fix it. This will work out. You have no assurance that this thing is going to work out at all. In fact, you, you might feel that it's almost destined for failure. And it's in that kind of situation that Micah speaks these beautiful words of truth in our text this morning. Micah 7, 6, and 7. As for me, I look to the Lord for help. I wait confidently for God to save me. And my God will certainly hear me. Don't gloat over me. <laughs> my enemies, don't gloat over me. For though I fall, I will rise again. And though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. This is the response of the righteous when they sit in darkness. And by darkness, I don't mean in in their own evil, but I mean when things don't make sense, and when we don't understand what God's, in do, God's doing, we can't see the answer. When we're in that place, that's when we watch for the Lord confidently, with assurance that we are being heard, and knowing that even though we have fallen, fallen, and even though there are mocking voices around us, we will rise, and even though you're in the dark, the Lord will give you light. And, and by light, I, I mean not just, not just understanding. He'll give you understanding, but also he will give you a joy in the midst of what you are facing, a, a lightness. <clears throat> As Christians, <clears throat> it's not wrong to find yourself in that situation where you're lost and don't know what to do. In fact, it's almost guaranteed that at some point you will find yourself in that situation and when you do, don't try and cover it up or pretend that's not the situation. Admit it. Say, yeah, I don't know what to do. Don't pretend to understand. Don't pretend to say, oh, yeah, I, I've got this all squared away. And don't pretend to have all the answers. It's, it's sometimes 
pathetic or, or, or um, just disconcerting when, when people don't know what to do and they start making things up. And, and then don't extrapolate some method of theology that claims to explain it all. That's, that's always folly. You know, sometimes it's best to have the theology of I don't know. To have the humility to say, I don't understand this. I don't get what's going on. And, and by that, I don't mean to throw away the, the, the foundations of the faith, those things that we know to be true in the scripture, but those things that we don't understand. Be humble and admit it that you don't have all the answers and you're simply trusting the Lord. There's a beautiful scripture that we, we sing that song. Um, that there may be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. It's from Psalm 30. For his anger is but for a moment. His, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. How, how many times have you let your heart be lifted by that promise? And I know I have many times, but what happens when that night is a really long night and particularly dark? And it's longer than you could ever imagine. When the darkness persists and the night becomes not just a season, but a series of seasons. And, and the darkness, the, the season of darkness actually starts to seem like a lifestyle because it's, it's, it's parlayed into years, years of darkness and the darkness swallows every shred of light. The proclamations of faith can start to grow thin. Those promises of God, they can, they can even become hollow and irritating. And, um, you know, as I point out Wednesday night, we, we have our beloved brother, Lee, who every, every week comes up. And what's he say? God is good. We say all the time. And I was watching you guys today. So you're like, oh, how are they going to respond? You guys were not uh, real loud. No, no, no. So, sometimes it's like, sometimes you're like, it doesn't even come out. Because it's just like, it doesn't feel good. If God's good, then why is it like this? Over and over and over, it's just not getting better. It can, it can be that you're just like, a place where maybe your heart is beginning to harden. What if the season starts to last so long that it seems like it's not not even just a detour, but this is your life story. This is just how it is. It's during these extended times of trial that we become weary and susceptible to the little voices of doubt that start to, start to speak it to us and tear at us and tear at our faith at God's promise. And I'm going to look at a, few, at a few examples of some people. We're in big company. Some people who, in the scripture, we see go through seasons like this. First there was Joseph, and you know, he started his life as, as a favored son. There were, there, were, there were blessings on him. He got the coat of many colors, and, and he knew that he was destined to become something great. His father, he showed him special favoritism. It made him, it made him so he was hated by his brothers. And, and I'll tell you what, Joseph did not handle this well. He... He ate it up. He's like, yeah, I'm special. Of course I am. And he even, he had a dream, and he wasn't smart about how he, he talked about it. He goes, I had a dream that everybody was going to bow down to me. Brothers, all of you, you're going to bow down and worship me. And Dad, you're going to worship me too. You're going you're gonna to bow before me. And, I mean, that was a very offensive thing to say, but he just didn't get it. And so even Dad was like, hey, cool it there, Joseph. My favorite son, but he, he just crossed the line. But his brothers just hated him. And so here was this guy with these great expectations and all this, all this that was set before him, all this greatness. And his brothers plot to kill him. And they throw him in a pit. Well, they decide not to kill him and he's sold into slavery. <laughs> Can you imagine his feelings? About, hey, wait, 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 favorite son. I'm not, you're not supposed to do this to me. This isn't supposed to happen. But he probably thought, oh, you know what? This is a good pass for and he was sold into slavery. And then he was in Potiphar's house. Now, you know, the, the Bible kind of does one of those things where it kind of just does a jump. It makes it sound like 
his time in Potiphar's house was a, maybe a short time, but it was a matter of years that he had to prove himself. All of a sudden, he had to learn the lessons to uh, have his character match his great his great destiny, and he had to work and, and and show himself to be something special rather than just have the promise of being something special. And he did it. Year after year, he was just faithful, and he started going through the ranks. And eventually, he became right under Potiphar, the right hand man. And so he was probably starting to think, "Hey, you know what? It's happening. All those they try to take it from me. Can't keep the good man down. They put, they tried to kill me. They tried to they, they tried to some they put me in slavery. But even as a slave, I the cream rises to the top." <laughs> But because he was such a man of integrity, when Potiphar's wife tried to seduce him, and he, he held on to his morality and ran from her, and was falsely accused, he was thrown into prison. Huh. Now twice he had been close to greatness, and twice he had lost it. Can you imagine him being in that pit thinking, you know, if it's a promise from God, then why is it so hard to see it happen? What's a guy got to do to make God's promises happen? He, I mean, he, he probably had these moments of doubt. But then a couple high-powered high people from, from the king's court, from Pharaoh's court, were thrown into prison with him. And because Joseph had this gift, these special gifts, he was so special, he could interpret dreams. He was able to give some information of his supernatural gift to the baker. And the baker, because of this, this dream, was set free. And, and so the baker knew. He said, oh, yeah, I, because I will remember you, because you've got something special. And when I, get, when I get out of here and I get back in the Pharaoh's court, I'm remembering you. And he's like, yeah, okay, see, I'm out of here. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen for a long time. It didn't happen for a season, two seasons. It, moved into years. And I'll tell you what, one thing in business you start to realize that um, delayed silence equals a no. <laughs> yeah, oh, you guys all know that. Yeah, they just weren't going to risk, you just, you just thought, yeah, they forgot me. So he's sitting there, and he's in this dark place. And imagine the voices that came to him. Yeah, you know what? I had my brushes with royalty and my, with greatness. And I royally screwed it up. And you know what? God had a promise, but I, I made sure that that wasn't going to happen. I was arrogant. And then in Potiphar's house, I was stupid. I, I should have known. I, I could have I handled that differently. I, I maybe got myself in the situation. I just should have avoided her. I, I could have done something. He was maybe rethinking himself, thinking, I, now I don't even have the opportunity to fix it. And day after day, he watches the promise get further and further away, and he feels that he's forgotten. Why wasn't God answering him? That journey from, from being thrown into that pit to finally being set free, because eventually, Pharaoh had a dream, and he needed an interpreter, and all of a sudden, it was in the best interest of the baker to go, oh, I'm the man of the hour. I got your answer. There's a guy in prison right now. He can help you. And so Joseph, Joseph was set free. And he went and he interpreted the dream. And <laughs> all of a sudden, he, overnight, he became the second most powerful man in the known world at that time. He became second, second to Pharaoh. And all of those visions came true. But that journey took 13 years. And when he got the vision, when he got the promise, he was 17. So almost a lifetime. Part of the promise was he's going to see his, his, his family again. Well, it was another 11 years after that. So 24 years of waiting to see what God had promised. I don't know about you, but when I hear a promise from God, I almost think like, oh, well, I'm waiting by the phone. Like, when's it, it's going to happen now, right? I got God's promise. And then you, she's like, this is this. It almost seems like it's taking as long as it would naturally. <laughs> so, Didn't this just happen? And that's a voice that God that, that you'll hear. You say, no, yeah, they're, they're not involved with it, but it's not true. 
When he finally did see the release, it was, it was amazing. But now he'd been made ready. Imagine if all these promises had come true when he was that cocky young man. It would have been a disaster, and, and the blessings would have crushed him. David was supposed to be king by prophecy. <laughs> you know, they came and anointed him. It was just so amazing. God had so specifically called him out. And then, then there was a need. The Philistines had come and there was a giant. And he was going to destroy all of Israel and nobody could stand up against him. But David said, I will do it. And he just, he took those stones and, and slew the giant. Now, in, a, in a fairy tale, what happens when you kill a giant? How do you live? Happily ever after. After a great victory like that, you would expect like, oh man, it's it's all coming. Just like the, like Bob's song, like all those uh, all those blessings lined up to happen to you. It's just like that's what you would expect, but that's not what happened at all. He was immediately thrown into a court that was so dysfunctional that and, and it boggled the mind. Like, wait a minute, this is this is supposed to be God's anointed, and this is so so crazy and he's throwing spears at me but but then i'm out but i'm not out i'm in and they love me and i'm god's still with me but it's like not working out it's very confusing when you see god's promise become something that doesn't just fall into place and there seems to be mixed messages and you're like god i don't get this i don't understand what's happening but then he just holds on he holds on to his integrity and then finally, it just gets worse and worse and worse. And he's out. And he's running for his life, living in caves. And the, do those voices come to him? You know, we have a record of it. Most of the book of Psalms, we, we see David crying out in this place. You can see song after song, poem after poem, say, why have you done this? Why don't you hear me? I mean, he complains loudly. We... He echoes those voices that are in his own head, those, those demonic voices that are coming tearing down, the voices of the people, of the philosophers outside watching this thing, the people that were jealous of him saying, oh, oh, oh how the mighty have fallen. And those things all taunt him. And then, and then he, he, he finally pretends that he's crazy. Now, all of a sudden, his early songs, he's talking about, God, hear me in my integrity. Now he doesn't have integrity anymore. He doesn't even have that to say, okay, God, Okay, I messed up, but okay, maybe this is you start to think, this is just a judgment. Of course, yeah, that, that I deserve this. This is what's happening, and, and you start to think, well, the God, promises of God, forget it. That that I blew that, and and now just give me some mercy. I I don't even know what to ask for. Hope deferred makes a heart sick. When your heart is sick and you and you hear these taunting voices, you are apt to agree to those voices over the promises of God. <laughs> but that's that's not how it ended. And that's not what happened. David did receive all those promises. God did bring him to that place. He did answer him. And David did not arrive as a proud man. He, he arrived into the fullness of his promises as a, as a humble man. Um, that's what happens. You know, we, we start to think that, oh, God gave me a promise, and if I do all right, and if I... If I hold to the course, if I'm, if I'm a good boy or a good girl, then God's going to give me the promise, and you start to think you deserve it as if you ever did. We've never deserved God's promises, and when he makes the promise, he knows full well what your actions will be in the future. And then, uh, if you don't mind, I want to tell you a little bit about my own loss over the past few years. Um, when I was a very young man, I was in New York, and uh, I had I had come up from a, a lot of adversity and, and, and a lot of problems, and and all of a sudden it seemed like the world was just going to fall in place. The very first time I went into a studio um, to to just do a demo, somebody on the spot said, "You know what? You you need a record deal. You're going to be a star." What? You know, like those movies, like I was discovered. And then it didn't, it didn't happen so fast. But it, it didn't seem like anything would fall apart. I just went, well, you know what? That was just the first thing. Like, it's going to happen to me. And then I moved to New York. And, and I wasn't there but a few months. And all of a sudden, I was already being considered for major roles and major films. 
I, my first time auditioning for something that, on, on Broadway, I got up to the last two people to play the lead in a Broadway play. There are people that live their whole careers and never even get close. And then, not only that, they were, there's this possible record contract and this possible record contract. I, and at my school, everybody said, oh, man, Michael, you just come here and just like eat my stardust. I thought I was going to be something. But then it didn't work out. And I was really far from the Lord at the time, and my own inner life was just, just decaying away. And I was just becoming more and more depressed. And then, and then it, wasn't, it wasn't even functional. I got to the point where I was ready to take my own life, and that's when, when I called out to God, I returned to him, and he just filled me with like another, I rose from the ashes. So, so I conquered, conquered adversity once, I've now, again, I've been raised up, so wouldn't everything just work out? But it wasn't that way. All of a sudden, I was thrust into the confusion of what am I going to do with my life. But I knew I wanted to be in ministry. I came out to California, and I just took the lowest place. I was the janitor. And, and then, again, you know, things started to happen, you know, because they heard me sing. And then Odin, he would just help me so much. And he brought me to the attention of Chuck. And Chuck just loved it. And, and so they gave me a record deal. And then I was out touring, and I got the idea to write this play. And the play just took off. I, I mean, I look at this, I, I can't even think of anything that's quite like it. I, I mean, I, I, was, I was out, just Jody and I, we were, we were filling up stadiums. We were, we were filling the pulpit of, of every major Calvary Chapel guy, you know? And, and, and Chuck just, just seemed to pour favor on me. And, and it just seemed like, you know, wow, this, this all happened. It's just like... Oh, finally, it's all come true. But behind the scenes, it was really painful. There were, there were things going on that were just soul crushing. And, and I began to see that, that a lot of times when, when you're doing something Christian arts, a lot, of, a lot of people don't consider you really a minister. They consider you sort of like thing of the day. And, and so I thought, you know, I was both in these relationships, but really I was just like, well, yeah, you're the artist that's coming through right now. And, when we're done with you, we'll go to the next artist. And I realized that that horrible show business that I'd been in, I was in it again, and I didn't even sign up for it. But there it was, and slowly I started to see myself shelved. And I would come up with things that, that some of them were failures, and some of them, well, not failures, but I never again achieved that level of success. Although there, there were some things that had more success than others, but. But I could see that this wasn't something that was going to sustain. And I wondered, had I done something wrong? Was there, was there something lacking in me? Was I not? God seemed to have promised this, but now it seemed to be just slipping through my fingers. And I would try to repent of things or figure something out. And my mind was beguiled. And then, then it, got, it got even more bleak. And then... I had an accident that that took me took away my ability to walk for quite a while, and I was sitting on a couch, unable to move. I was sitting in darkness, and I was taunted by those thoughts and those fears and the guilt, and, and I just thought, uh, and and I had to take painkillers. We come from a church where where Pastor Chuck said, well, even when I go and get dental work, I don't pay, take pain to the church. He's John Wayne, I'm like, well, give me another pill. Okay, I'm not John. I'm not Chuck. I'm just like, well, and it's, it's, making, it's making me loopy. You know, the, 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 and, and I just thought, oh, see, I, I'm, I can't think right. And, and this is like, I'm here. Yeah. This, I, I started to make things up that I was doing wrong, and I just felt guilty, and I, I, I just... I felt so ashamed, and then I, I just, I wasn't that bright, shining boy for Jesus anymore. And I was having thoughts that were really bitter. And I thought, yeah, well, you know, God had a plan for me. He, he was going to do something with me, but boy, I blew that. You know what? Started out, the things my, my dad told me, they were all true. Yeah, I, I got really, see, this is how bad it is. I even had the opportunity. I had the open door and I blew it. I took something great and parlayed it into being this pathetic middle-aged man with kind of nowhere to go. 
those were the voices that became the taunts of me. I mean, I just thought, you know, uh, even, even the things that I had down, they just seemed to be slipping away. It, 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 those taunting and tem condemning voices that come from the outside, well, they torment us, but there's nothing like the voices that come from inside yourself and inside your own camp. Those can be the most deceptive and damaging. Um, let's let's quick, quickly look at one more name from the Bible, the book of Job. Job was a righteous man. In fact, God said of him, of all the people on earth, Job is the finest man in all the earth. He said this in front of the whole heavenly court when they were all gathered. He, he brought him up. He said, hey, have you considered Job? Finest man on the earth. And Satan said, oh yeah, you know what? He's the accuser. He said, you know why he's faithful to you? Because you keep him hemmed in, you edge him in. He, he gets every blessing. He doesn't have to face anything hard. You take his wealth. You take his children. You take his health. He'll curse you in no time. And that's what happened. God said, all right, have Adam. I'll show you. Um, Job suffered a series of losses, including his wealth, his children, his reputation, his support system, his health. And he sat in darkness, not knowing what had happened. And then, while he was infirm, three friends came. And their voices, as they spoke to him, they sounded right, because they were based on right concept. They were based on the theology that they, that they all shared. But there was a just enough twist to make their input crushing. First, there was Elphaz basically said that Job was being punished for what he had done. It says in Job 4, 7, who that was innocent was ever punished. And you know what? It is a right concept that God punishes sin. He cares very much about our morality. And, 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 and he, will, he will bring justice. He will bring, bring, um, he will bring that final uh, end to, to our works. But the application here is false. Because in the church, sometimes we do this to ourselves. We start out with grace. Like, yes, come to Jesus just as you are. And we come, we pray. And okay, okay, now you're saved. Okay, from here on in, it's karma, baby. <laughs> if, you, if you do good, then God's going to bless you. If you do bad, you get, you're out. That, that's, that's not right. Okay, is it a biblical concept that you reap what you sow? Yes. But it has to be applied in light of the cross. The cross changes everything. Yes, there, there are concepts that are true, but the tension that God holds in tr are, is truth in, that's what we have to pay attention to. Yes, it is true that um, we can be punished for our sins. We, we can, by our own hand, ruin our life. But if that's not your intention, I don't think God's going to let you do it by No, God will not let you do it by mistake. It's not what I think. He will not let you do it by mistake. He will be with you. And he is going to use everything in your life for good. That's the promise. And we are saved by his blood, by his, by, by his suffering on the cross. He took that for us. Yeah, there, was there punishment? Was there justice? Yes, it went on the cross. And Job, Job knows that this isn't the case. He knows that he hasn't done anything that is, that is overtly wrong. And, and he defends himself. And then Bildad, the next speaker, comes. And he builds on Elphaz's idea that, hey, you sinned, and that's why everything's going wrong for you. But he does it in a different way. He indicates that maybe Job, Job's being judged in a slightly more general way, that perhaps it has to do with his ancestors or his children, um, and that, that, that he's being tested for a greater reward. And, you know, those, those things sound all right, but when, when you're in the midst of the pain and it's really personal and you're crying out to God, it gives you precious little comfort. Elphaz says, does God pervert justice or does the Almighty pervert the right? If your children sinned against him, he delivered them into the power of their transgressions. For Job to hear that maybe it's not just his sin that, that God's punishing for, him for, but maybe one of his relative's sins, then it's just like, oh... Well, I can't control that. God seems even further away. And, and, and then Job's like, 
how do I deal with this? And he complains that now God's inaccessible. Job says it in Job 9, who am I that I should try to answer God or even reason with him? Even if I were right, I would have no defense. I, I could only plead for mercy. And even if I summoned him and he responded, I'm not sure he would listen. He wouldn't listen to me because you know what he does to me? He attacks me with storms and repeatedly wounds me without cause. Now, Job seems even more hopeless because it's like, well, I, my own sin, I, I can't even bear the, the punishment, but now also for somebody else. And then Zophar speaks, and he doubles back on the whole thing that God's punishing me for sin, but he makes it even more general. And he says, you know what? We all mess up. And in fact, Job, as bad as things are, you probably deserve more. And, and he makes God seem even further away. That, that, that it's arbitrary. God just brings horrible things on you. And you, it doesn't make, matter what you do. It doesn't matter all of your life. No matter how you act. <laughs> the worst thing can possibly happen. It's completely out of your control. Is the concept in the scripture that it rains on the just and the unjust alike? Yes, it is. But, but you have to interpret that in the light that God's involved with you personally. Job says, can, the, can, can, you, Zophar says, can you solve the mysteries of God? Can you discover everything about the Almighty? Such knowledge is higher than the heavens. And who are you? It's deeper than the under, underworld. What, what do you know? It's broader than the earth and wider than the sea. Job affirms God. But he says, you know what? I can't handle this. You mean it's nothingness? And you know what, this is worse than, than just being an existentialist. This is worse than, than, than being a heathen or a pagan. At least with a, as a pagan, you, you have some God that you can try to appeal to for some help. Because, but if, if, this is, if nothing means anything, then the, then the futility is more than I can bear. And, and it goes against everything I know about God, all, all, all this relationship. And so, so he, just, he says, no, you know what? I've had it. You, you guys, I don't want to speak to you. When we're sitting in darkness, it's a little comfort to become philosophical without taking Jesus into the equation. Then Elihu speaks. Like Job's friends, he asserts, affirms the general truths. But he didn't come with Job's friends. He, those three came. We don't know when Elihu shows up. But he just... He just does. But he says something different. He points out that Job was more interested in proving himself right than affirming God. He says his wrath was aroused because he justified himself rather than God. He says, but you're obsessed with the, with the case of the wicked. Judgment and justice seize you. When it comes down to it, Job has been asking the wrong questions, according to Elihu. And then God speaks. And he asks God, Job a series of questions about God's power and his wisdom. And the, and the knowledge is compared, and his knowledge is compared to Job's. And you've and you probably become aware of some of the questions. Like, hey, where were you when I was laying the foundations of the earth? Huh? Do, you, do you know anything about that? Do you know where I keep the storehouses laden with snow? Do, do you know why it rains here and it rains here? Do you understand the fury of my storm? Do you understand the, the delicate things that I do? Do you understand anything that I do? Now, he wasn't, he wasn't asking questions, expecting Job to answer. These were rhetorical questions because you would, if you go, uh, no, I don't, no, I wasn't. Of course, you would never be able to say, yeah, I understand all that. And he, no, none of Job's questions were directly answered by God's questions. He was humble. And this is what happened. This is what was restored to Job. His sense of wonder. His sense of saying, you know what? I don't have it all figured out. I have not taken this amazing relationship with God, methodized it, turned it into a, a quid pro quo. Or, okay, I got it down. I went up, I said the prayer. Now I'm saved. I went, I got the baptism. Now I have my set of rules from church. 
I don't do this, I don't do this, I don't do this. And I do, I pay the tithe, and I do this, and, and, and now I've got it down, and so God now owes me blessing. That's how, that's how it's supposed to work, right? That, God's not going to settle for that. That is not what he gave his precious blood for. He, he has so much more. It's not just some method. He wants to give you a life that is so much more than just following the rules of some religion or think you've got to go down path or you being this smug person that says, yes, well, I have. I used to be, but now I have risen up to... You know, when you see those people, what does it do to you? It's crushing, isn't it? You're just like, oh. It, 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 doesn't, it doesn't give life. No, he wanted he wanted Job to live in, in the vitality and to share God's very nature of, of that amazing life that would go out forever and go out and bless people and be a fountain of freshness and joy and, and, and adventure and, and 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 love. Not to not just, just turn it into some some religion. So so we don't have to li live anymore in the slavery of just trying to be accepted by, by keeping the appearance up. But now we live in the freedom of being recipients of grace. In Hebrews, we're told to come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. And when that time of need is an extended time of need, we find that the throne of grace never runs out. We can't come pleading to God when we are in need based on our lack of sin. We, we, we saw some of those heroes. They, they found out who they were, so they pleaded with God, not based on their integrity, but now based on his mercy. But we can't depend on God's faithfulness based on our own worthiness, but on his sacrifice. Spurgeon says, you have as much right to the precious things of the covenant as the most advanced believers. For your right to covenant mercies lies not in your growth, but in the covenant itself. And your faith in Jesus is not the measure, but the token of your inheritance in him. We're part of God's bigger plan. And, and he wants us to own our faith. If, if there's some given moment when we don't see his hand, we don't need to panic and fear saying, Oh no, it's all over. Oh, I, I blew it. And then you start to wonder, what should I do? It's, that's the place where we make foolish decisions. It's the, it's the place where we can have emotional breakdowns. Recognize that God is still with you. And he is do, doing something that is so far beyond what you could ever hope for. When you're in darkness, let your faith be firmly planted in God's grace. Not in your ideas of justice and your own righteousness. He wants to give you the real faith that you own. That test of faith comes when we don't have a clue of the situation. When, we, when the world would tell you that it's hopeless, all you have is God's word. You're tempted to twist that word to, to meet, your, meet the situation. He promised, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will guide you. And you will have times in your life when you'll say, I don't know what God's doing. There's a, there's a promise. He said, though you walk through the fire, I'll be with you. And, and, and then when you walk through the flood, you will not be overcome. You will not be drowned. And I think for me, when I think about not being drowned, I think not being drowned in that introspection, the what ifs, and not understanding. It says in Micah 7, 6 and 7, as for me, I look to the Lord for help. I will wait confidently for God to save me, and my God will certainly hear me. You can be God confident God will save you. You can be confident that God certainly will hear you. And when those, those voices of the enemy, even that seem like they arise from your own heart when they speak to you and gloat over you, though just say to that voice, though I fall, I will rise again. And though I sit in darkness, the Lord will give me light. There'll be times when you just don't know. And all you can do is say, okay, I'm just going to sit here in the darkness, but the Lord will give me light. I don't understand it. I don't know. But you know what? The Lord's going to give me light. I don't have a clue how it's going to work out. But the Lord will give me a light. How about that? That's what I got. That's what I'm holding on to. 
And that's what we hold on to when we don't understand. We hold on to the truth of God's promises that he has not left you. It doesn't matter how long the season. You can hold on to God's light. Sitting in that darkness, it doesn't matter how much time you've spent there and how many thoughts you've entertained. God's light is greater than every bit of that darkness. And when he turns on the light, all the darkness disappears. Do we have a hope that will not disappoint? Yes, we do. Do we have seasons when we, when our hearts will be sick? Yes. Do we understand why God's doing it? Not completely. No, maybe not at all. But we know God. And we know that he loves us and he hears us. And he has not forsaken us even though it may seem to, to tarry, even though it may seem to take so long. He's with you. And it, it, will, it will be a sense of wonder. When Job's life was restored, I've heard it taught like, well, hey, you know, Job went through all that, but he got more back. He got he was richer than ever. He got all his kids. I'm like, wait, wait. New kids, that makes up for the dead ones? That's supposed to be a good thing? I'm like, no, that this still hurts. But what what I see now that's different is now he wasn't numb. Now he wasn't just everything is supposed to, you know, I got that going for me, got that going for me. Now he lived in wonder. Now he could own his blessings. Before he couldn't own his blessings, but now he could. If God's wounding you deeply, just like Brother Bob was singing, yes, there is that joy. And it's, it's deeper, deeper than the pain. And yes, it's as overcoming as the pain. There's, there is a flood of joy that is our inheritance. And no matter how deep the darkness, no matter how long, just keep looking because the light is coming. Father, I pray that we would be able to hold this promise true. Thank you that you are kind and you are good. And yes, God is good all the time. We can say an amen, even if there's a season of pain, even if, if there's a, a time when, when we are crushed. Father, your, your hope is greater still. Thank you that if, as we go through these, these lessons of faith that we are in good company. And thank you that you're with each one and you love each one. You're, Lord, you're, you're fascinated with each person here. You know what's going on in their lives. And, and, and they're precious to you. Thank you, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name.